So I've made a tentative schedule to keep me progressing because I've sort of, you know, let work and everything else sort of take precedence over the mathematics, but that's not, um, you know, it's not why I started this channel. The Cephalo Monk is supposed to represent the monk like um, habits, the, the rituals. Um, the, the ritual of doing mathematics every day really, um, it's not something, at least for myself, that you know I can go weeks and then jump back into with perfect freshness, uh, perfect retention. It's something that kind of needs to be around every day um, so that I can recall it. Um, so for the next four days I'm going to be doing reviews. Um, so if you've already, if you don't need a review, it's fine. You could just wait. Um, for hopefully November 20th, I'll be working on um, 1.4, which is going to be composition of functions. But today I'm going to go over uh, section 0, the real numbers again. So that's the real line, the algebra of real numbers, and inequalities, intervals, and absolute values. Um, and I just made this tentative schedule to hopefully... Uh, keep myself on track. Um, I should be finished if I'm able to get through one section each day, which, you know, it should be doable, but, you know, things do co come up. I'm giving myself to till January down here um, to finish it. Uh, we'll see how that goes. But after I'm done, I am will hopefully be moving into, um, we'll see, we'll see how, what, where I feel comfortable. If um, I've already taken Calculus 1 in, a, in some different formats, um, but, you know, if I feel like this book has, uh, has left me with some, you know, still feeling shaky. Uh, oh, I might pick up another book for calculus. Uh, if not, uh, the the original plan was to jump into calculus two in some sort of uh, course, some credited course. Um, but you know, that's putting the cart two months before the horse. So um, let's jump into the review of. 0 0.1, 0 0.2, and 0 0.3. So this is for those of you who have the book. Um, it's, uh, 0 0.1 starts on page 2. So I'm not sure what would be the best if, if I go back and actually just kind of review these notes. Um, You know, let me, I'm going to just, hmm, let's see how much, okay, there's not that, there's not, these were the main reasons I wanted to go back over these, all the identities, okay.
I'm just going to go back over these notes real quick. Real numbers. So square equal to two. No rational number has a square equal to two. Okay. Why would I write that down? This section contains as an optional highlight the ancient Greek proof that no rational number has a square equal to 2. Okay. So it appears from here because it should be seen by everyone at least once. As I stuff is mostly a few. A thorough grounding and real number system will serve you well through this course. So we have integers, rational numbers, which are just the division of integers. Um, and then we have the real numbers.
These are the integers on the real line. These are some rationals on the real line. So what are the real numbers? Is there anything on the... Ah, it's, it's everything on the line, right? So it can't be... Well, obviously not imaginary numbers, but... <sighs> what exactly distinguishes? Okay. Gaps that every conceivable distance can be represented on the point of line. These line shown above the real line. We think that each point on the real line is corresponding to what we call the real numbers. Mm. Okay. Okay, it's saying that. The undefined intuitive notions such as no gaps, so right, so we, we can conceive that we'd be able to fill in um, all the spaces with labels. Um, but it's saying that we're just going to have to uh, take for granted, we're going to have to take on faith, you know that and higher and and advanced mathematics they are able to um, prove that so right now um, they're saying just let your intuitive notions that we can fill in these gaps um, be the things that define the the system the real number system Okay, real number rational. Is every real number rational? Well, hmm. is every real number rational? So, I'm assuming that mean meaning integers, whole numbers, like two, like one and two. Well, I can get 1 by just doing 1 divided by 1, and I get 2 by 2 divided by 1. I mean, if that counts as a rational number. Uh, what about... What what wouldn't it be a rational number? Is every real number rational? So it's somewhere on the, somewhere on the line. Is there a number on the line that could not be represented as a fraction? Um, I don't know. We know that for every rational number corresponds to some point. We know that every rational number corresponds to some point on the real line. But do we know? But do we know the, you know, the opposite, the 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 reciprocal? Um. So we know that every rational number corresponds at some point on the real line, but do we know that every point on the real line is a rational number, right? You see how it's not, um, uh, the first statement, every rational number corresponds to some point on the real line, just goes one way, right? Um, so let's say every rational number, so based on what we had before, we see these um, numbers here being represented as uh, rational numbers. So they're all in the real line, right? Um, so that's good, but what about this stuff in here? Is all that stuff, all these all these places in between that are filled up with all those infinite numbers? Are all those rational? Is every real number rational? Probably. The first people to ponder these issues. Oh, 
uh, saying that the the ancient Greeks discovered it. That no, it's they don't. To see how they came, let's go make a brief. Recall that each right triangle. Let's let's draw this part. Okay. Yeah, so I'm gonna just start a little review page. So why not? Review. Zero point one, zero point two, and zero point three. Um, what was I doing? Oh, what did I want? I wanted to put some. Oh, the date. Jeez. Okay. Uh, so it's November. What eighteenth, sixteenth. Ay ay ay. 2017. Alrighty. So that's. What about these Greeks? Uh, recall that for each right triangle, the sum of the squares of the lengths of the two sides that form the right triangle equals the square of the length of the hypotenuse. Okay. So. Bada bing. Bada boom. A right triangle. So what is it? It's like x, y, and z. Z being the hypotenuse. So what's the x squared plus y squared is equal to z squared? Okay. And the next figure illustrates the result, which is called the Pythagorean theorem. Yeah. This theorem is named in honor of the Greek mathematician Pythagoras. I wish I had a. Do I? Well, who is that by? Raphael. There's like a there's a painting of all the philosophers. I think Pythagoras is down over in the uh, left. Anyways, okay, cool. <laughs> the Babylonians had discovered this result a thousand years earlier. Burn, sick burn. Okay, um, yep, yeah, had that. Now consider the special case where both sides. That form the right triangle have a length of one. Mm -hmm. Okay. C squared equals two. Okay, the isosceles right triangle. Pythagorean theorem implies that C squared equals two, yeah. See that there's a positive real number, C. Let's see this raises the question. Whether this exists, there exists a rational number, c, such that c squared is equal to two. Ah. we have this raises the question of whether there exists a rational number c. Uh, such that c squared is equal to 2. We should try to find a rational number whose square 
equals two by experimentation. Where's the calculator? I like how I underlined this course does not focus much on proofs. So why would I underline that? Okay. What is it that, that this is trying to achieve here? So we're doing 99 divided by 70 uh, squared. Okay, that does not equal to, wait, what? A rational number whose square equals two by experimentation. Because we have found rational numbers whose squares are very close to 2, you might suspect that with further cleverness, we could find a rational number whose square equals 2. Huh? However, the ancient Greeks provide, proved this is impossible. Well... Hmm. So, hmm. So it can't be two over one. That's no good. Why? Why are these things? <sighs> Division is inverse of multiplication. Okay, maybe, hmm, I'm assuming, I'm assuming you can't do that, right? I'm assuming you can't, well, no. So my assumption was that if I had like two over one or four over two, right, those equal two. Um. That's what is going on. Okay, so no rash, no rational number. Uh, is an integer. No? What's going on here? Because we have found rational numbers with squares very close to two, you might suspect that with further cleverness we could find a rational number. Okay, rational number is just one that is on the... Mm. Proof by contradiction. Uh, we will start by assuming that there is a rational number whose square equals two. Okay. 
Using that assumption, we will arrive at a contradiction. So our assumption must be incorrect. Thus, we, there is no rational number whose square equals two. Proof suppose there exists integers m and n such that, okay. Suppose there exist integers m and n such that m over 2 squared equals 2, right, because that's an integer, I mean, sorry, these are the two integers which make up a rational number, so there's no, so what does it ask me, it's, what? it's so weird how, why, how this is, like, Canceling any common factors, we can choose m and n to have no factors in common. Good lord. In other words, m di divided by n is reduced to lowest terms. The equation above is equivalent to the equation m squared equals 2n squared. Okay. Let's do let's let's do this. Okay. m squared, n squared, 2, bring it over, bring it as 2 over, get, so well, we're not, we're not going to bring it over, right? Let's do it more, let's be more rigorous. What are we doing? We are allowed to multiply both sides by the same thing. And what am I choosing to multiply these signs by? n squared over 1. n squared over 1. Crosses out, and you're left with m squared equals to 2n squared. Okay. This implies that m squared is even. Sure. Yeah. Why does it imply that? Good God. Because the square of each odd number is odd. Yeah. Because each, because the square of each. Is that true? Oh, how did I forget all this already? This is why it's important. 3 squared. 1 squared. 5 squared. 7 squared. 9 squared. Why did that not... Wow, why is that non-intuitive? Okay. <sighs> Good God. Okay. Good thing they graph right now, right? Okay, so that's um, that's okay. Okay, wait, wait, wait.
what? Why does it assume? How does it know that M? Okay, is it because there's a two over here? Right, so if I did like, right, okay, let's say that this was an odd number. Right, so three. So we're getting, we're getting nine times two. And that even number, you're getting evens on this side. Right, so it doesn't matter. <sighs> so any hmm so anything times an even is an even one times two one times three I mean sorry <laughs> two times one even two times two even two times three even two times four even ah clever God. Okay. So. Wow. So there, there. That needed to be explained in more than one sentence for me. Okay. So. Since this side must be an even. Well, if it's equal, if this side is equal to this side, this. This, this must be an even. And if all odds squared are odds, then m cannot be an odd because uh, and the m squared would be odd. So m must be even. Okay. M equals two K. So let's give him why. Some integer. Why is that the case? Why? Wh what a weird thing to do. What a non-intuitive thing to do. So they want me to, okay, they're like, well, look at this. M is even. Well, cool, great, thanks. Um, but, but, but thus, thus, M is 2K for some integer K. What? Okay, so I'm assuming that all evens can be are divisible by two, right? So I'm guessing that's what they're getting this k from. All right, so we have. So, so weird though. That's just how would I kn know that that that's helpful? Like how do how would I know to do this? You know, unless I yeah, that's maybe I sh I just shouldn't know. I mean, maybe the point is that you know they did this proof probably took them a you know a couple couple hours maybe I don't know. Uh, being facetious, I know it probably took a while to do this, but the way it's presented here is very non-intuitive. What the hell is going on? 
Um, okay. So we got this 2k squared. <sighs> let's distribute. Or not distribute, let's apply the function, right? Because being squared is a function, yeah? 2k is going into the function of being squared. So you run the, the 2 through there first, you get a 4. You run the k through there, you get a k squared. And this is just multiplication. What can we do? For a Klondike bar, we can divide by 2s from both sides, so we get. to k squared, n squared. This implies that n is even. Yep, because we got the same thing from up here. Which is weird, it's okay, yeah, mm-hmm. Right, because, okay. So n is even. Well, if m is even, and n is even, what does that mean? Well, we have shown that both m and n are even, contradicting our choice of m and n as having no factors in common. Ah. So that's a rational number. That's a much better explanation for a rational number. A rational number. A rational. This isn't in the book. No, this is what I've just gotten out of this experience right here. A rational number number has no common factors between its numerator and denominator. That's a much better explanation. Well, I don't know why it doesn't say that, right? We have shown that both M and N are even, contradicting our choice of M and N as having no factors in common. Right? They're both even. If they're both even, they're both divisible by 2, which means they have a common factor, which means they're non rational, they are just integers. Says this contradiction means our original assumption that there is a rational number whose square equals 2 must be incorrect. Thus, there do not exist integers m and n such that m divided by n equal, squared equals 2. There's a fun Sherlock quote. <laughs> a fun Sherlock Holmes quote. Page five. Right after the proof to drive home the idea of proof by contradiction. Okay. Let's uh, pick it up. Station. Say that rad two, no, oh, okay. We do. We did a 
or add 2 squared. That equals 2. But this is going to be an irrational number. It's not going to be a rational number. It's not on that real number line, right? Or is it? Well, real, no. Well, I don't know. Is it a non-real? I know it's... Hmm, let's see. We have just shown that rad2 is a rational number. A real number that is not rational, it's called a rational. Okay, so it is still a real number. So we got rationals, irrationals, and integers, I guess, on that real number line. So let's try that out. So we have the real number line. So on it we have rationals, irrationals, integers. Well, let's see if we get any more. What did I find one irrational number? Finding out is much easier. As shown in the next two examples. Good. Okay. Example one. The attitude of the ancient Greeks toward irrational numbers persisted in our everyday use of irrational to mean not based on reason. <laughs> okay. Suppose that three plus rad two is a rational number. because rad2 equals 3 plus rad2 minus 3. Mm -hmm. What? That implies that rad2 is the difference of two rational numbers. It's a rational number, which, eh? which is not true. Thus, our assumption of 3 plus rad2 is our rational number was incorrect. In other words, 3 plus rad2 is our irrational number. <sighs> Good God. The next example provides another illustration of how to use one irrational number to generate another irrational number. Okay. Suppose 8 times rad2 is a rational number. Why? Why would that be the case, though? I mean, we already know that eight is integer. Right, why would we think timesing or adding an irrational number to an integer? Get us an irrational. Will give us a rational number. I'll get the. Okay, this implies that rad two is a quotient of two rational numbers, which implies that rad two is a rational number, which is not true. Yeah. Some of the weird is going on. I don't know. I don't know what he's trying to. Demonstrate there. So our assumption of 8 rad 2 is a rational number. That's incorrect. Sure. Yeah, 8 times rad 2 is an irrational number. Yeah, why on earth would it? Mm. I don't know if I just, if it's just intuitive to me that adding and multiplying to irrational numbers won't get you an irrational number. Uh, 
It's like it's like if you had a fraction, right? It's like if you had a legitimate fraction, a non-reducible fraction, and you were started adding integers to it. It's like you could never get a you could never get a whole number out of that. Right? That doesn't it doesn't make any sense. Why why is he even showing this? It is uh, I guess the wording is confusing here. She already has all these examples down here. Yeah. He has all these examples where show that six divided by seven plus rad two is a rational number. So why don't I put it on the calculator? Is this just giving me an estimate then? Yeah, oh, does it? Oh, that's okay. Doesn't even give me an estimate. Uh, it just gives me back. Well, that's okay. How do I do that thing? Yeah, that was not how you do it. Okay. Okay, that. This. Whoa. No, not that. This. Yeah, you can't turn it into a fraction. Okay. Interesting. Okay, right. I mean, that makes sense, right? So that That's the whole thing. That's the whole reason why it's irrational. That's why I don't understand these questions because... Number six down here. Explain why the sum of a rational number uh, and a irrational number is an irrational number. Well, you know, it's like the the, 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 the sum of an even plus an odd. You know, it's just, they're different kinds. They are. Oh. Let's try this though. Um, what about the uh, product? So we have red two times. Whoa, that's not what I want. Red two times red two. Ooh, that's interesting. Okay, that makes more sense to me. That makes more sense to me because what is that quite simply what is rad 2 times rad 2 well that is rad 2 squared and what's that little trick that you can do crossing the squares and the radicals just get the integer 2 I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that on these problems because I'm annoying myself with them, but more importantly, I think it's just, it's just intuitive, right? Um, I would like to be more rigorous than that, though. Huh. I haven't been given a lot of tools.
Oh well. Onwards. Point two. By the end of the section, you should be able to manipulate algebraic expressions using the commutative, associative, and distributive properties. Uh, recognize the order of algebraic operations and the role of parentheses. All right. Apply the crucial identities. Okay, let's do a little bit of reading. Divide any two real numbers. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> we can add, subtract, multiply, and divide any two real numbers. Ah, that's important. Okay, that's useful. Uh, really? We can add, subtract, multiply, and divide any two real numbers. So if we have a... Got that number line. Got that number line. Mm. Have the number line, right? It's got all our real numbers on it. Let's pick two uh, random ones. Whatever they are, whether they're an integer, a rational, or an irrational, doesn't matter. If we pick, t pick any two on there, we will stay on this number line, whether we are adding, subtracting, multiplying, or dividing. That's useful. Okay, I'm going to write that out just because I think that's really important. We can add, subtract, multiply, and Divide any two real numbers and stay within the real system. Within the real system. Cool. Uh, with the exception of that division by zero, right? Which is undefined. <sighs> Why is that important? It's because we know if we're doing these operations, right? That our answer, or the result, Will be somewhere on this line, which narrows the space, I, I suppose. Okay, in this section, we will be the basic algebraic properties. Commutative. Yeah, these are important. Commutativity. A plus B equals B plus A. Yeah. Works for multiplication as well. 
associative. A plus B plus C equals A plus B plus C. All right, so blah 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 blah. blah. Guess just the, the way that we're grouping. Yeah. Oh, yep. Yeah. So it says, and the form associative associativity is the formal name for the property saying that grouping does not matter in addition and multiplication. So the multiplication would be like A, B, C, and I'm guessing it'd be like B. Yes. For all real numbers, A, B, and C. Okay. All real numbers, everything on that line. Okay, you know, Multiplication and division before addition and subtraction. Okay, so this is how I learned it in middle school. It's PEMDAS, parentheses, exponents. Multiplication, division, addition, subtraction. So this is the <laughs> temporal order, right, from left to right. So this is PEMDAS. Right. Um, little mnemonic device. Yeah, I'm not going to go over these. That's pretty standard. I won't go over distributive property. The distributive property connects addition and multiplication, converting a product with a sum into a sum of two products. A product, a product, a product with a sum, a product of a sum into the sum two products. Okay, very clever. I mean, the wording there is needlessly confusing, but anything for a turn of phrase. Ah, I keep stabbing myself. Now, sometimes you will use the distributive property transform expression. Sometimes you use it in the opposite direction. Direction of the transformation depends on the context. So simplify the expression. This is an example. T 
to 3m plus x plus 5x. So distribute 6m plus 2x plus 5x equals 6m plus 7x. Yeah. One of the most common algebraic manipulations involves expanding a product of sums, as in the following example. 8 plus b times x plus y. Think of x plus y as a single number. Mm, that is clever. I never have thought about it like that before. Wow. Okay. Well, anything in here, let's call it z. So, z is equal to x plus y. Right, so we have a plus b times z. So we have a z plus b z. Let's substitute in the x y. So we have a x plus y plus b x plus y. Mm. And let's distribute again. A x plus a y plus b x plus b y. That's cool. Okay. Note that in the formula we found here, every term in the first set of parentheses is multiplied in every term in the second set of parentheses. Sure. <sighs> Understand how they demi above was obtained, you should easily be able to find formulas for more complicated expressions. La, 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 la. So I'm going to do that again. I liked, I liked that uh, the strategy here. So let's do so it's you have a plus b times x plus y plus z. So normally the original way that I, I used to do these would be multiplying the first term by everything, then multiplying second term by everything. Um, but let's try turning this to a c. So we have c equals a plus b. So we have cx plus cy plus cz. Let's substitute them in. So we have a plus b equals x. Oh, times <laughs> times x a plus b times y and a plus b times z. Now we do these little multiplications ax plus bx plus ay plus by plus az plus bz. You know, more work but I kinda don't know why I like <laughs> I guess it's because it's different from how originally I've done it. Okay, cool, got that down. So additive and inverse, additive inverse and subtraction. Additive inverse of a real number, a is a number negative a, such that a plus negative a equals zero. Yeah, that makes sense. The connection between subtraction and additive inverse is captured by the identity a minus b is equal to 
a plus additive inverse b. I don't know if that's how you say it, but okay. In fact, the equation above can be taken as the definition of subtraction. Ah, yep, yep, yep. Okay. Yeah, I used to have a professor that would like to say that. that we don't really have subtraction. It's just that we're adding negatives. Um, okay. In fact, the equation above can be changed. Well, I don't know you need to come over using the following identities that involve additive inverses. So, we all know this one. Or if we should. I mean... I'm assuming if you know what a negative number is, you know that a negative times a negative is a positive, right? So, negative times negative a equals what? Positive a. And the negative a plus b, we don't need to write these out, right? Most of these are intuitive. Well, Negative a times negative b is a b. Yeah. Two negatives make a positive. Two negative. Uh, uh, the the uh, <laughs> it's getting late. Um, two. Are they are they products? Oh, uh, hmm. I actually don't know what the... Anyways, multiplying two, num two negative numbers, you get a... The product is positive. Okay. Um, let's see if I can stab myself with that. Okay, um... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Those are all good. Those... We don't need to bother. Identities arising from distributive property. Mm. Yeah, those ones are important. Those are less intuitive. Well, I mean, they are, though. Okay, so I'll, I'll write down the first one. So these identities writing, arising from the... I don't really like remembering identities. I mean, especially at this stage, because these are things that you should be able just to do, right? Um, after doing them a thousand times, you just know that negative times negative is a positive, right? So what is this one? Uh, these are important because these come up a lot. These are the ones that is more helpful when you memorize them. So, um, or these formats at least you will see. They're these the skeletons. So you get a squared plus two ab plus b squared. I'd recommend doing these over and over and over so that you know it's not that you remember that you're you know just memorizing them rotely it's just that you've done them so many times it's, there's a difference there's a difference between the way that you remember things right so um you don't want to not that you won't go, want to go and make flashcards for these, right? That's a, that's a certain type of just remembering. It's like it's like remembering to forget, right? So I'm just um, trying to get it into my brain so that I can hold on to it for a little bit of time, um, and then I can forget it. Uh, when you do when you do that, I feel like you don't get the the weaving part, right? The weaving part of knowledge. Um, when you actually do this, 
a hundred times, you start to see, oh, well, um, this, this helps for like when you're distributing, especially, um, you like, or distributing or trying to reduce, um, or simplify, sorry. Um, these are helpful. And that's why they're identities, you know, identities are helpful. Um, a squared minus 2ab plus b squared. And the last one, a plus b times a minus b is equal to a squared minus b squared. So the example, which is going to use this third one, without a calculator to evaluate um, 43 times 37. Example, 43 times 37. So we have a 40 plus a 3. Um, and a 40 minus a 3. See, that, I don't know, man, this is a, that would, yeah. this is the complaint I have with this book is that it's not intuitive what he's doing, right? So far. And this, we're not even in the first chapter yet. Um, like how, how, it's not intuitive for someone that doesn't do this, that we're, we're supposed to line these up right so that what so that what it's that uh, this is 40 squared and this is negative 3 squared so you know no calculator but but of what's 4 squared is 16 add those zeros minus 3 squared minus 9 you get uh, 91 um, yeah. So it's just, it's, it's like, can you see see how this is similar? I mean, it's just one of those things. One of those things where you just kind of have to do a lot, and at some point it will sort of click where it's like ah that looks like that structure here I've done that a thousand times it looks like this structure uh, I can organize my you know multiplication problem here into that sort of structure make it a little bit easier on myself yeah, the first time I was doing this the very first time I think I ran through this I was having the problem like what why how, how? Well, how how does any of this match up? Because I was doing like something like forty plus three and thirty plus seven. It's like yeah, I don't, I'm not getting it. <laughs> you know. Okay, moving on. Multiplication and fractions and cancellation. Ooh, okay, yeah. Multiplication inverse first. Okay, if a real number b that doesn't equal zero is a number one over b. Check that. Yeah, yeah. So multiplication inverses. So you got a b. Its inverse is one over b. To the okay. Assume all denominators are similar. First identify. Just identify above states that product. The numerator and the Second identity. Eh? Okay. Yeah. So we know how to do fraction multiplication. So you got a fraction. This is a B. <laughs> C over D, multiply across, AC over BD. 
Oh, okay. I check that day and we'll have a fresh in there as far as. Uh huh. Right, yeah. That's not. Oh, what the hell? Okay. Simplify this expression 3 over x squared minus 1 times x plus 1 over. X, so we multiply across 3x plus 3 divided by x squared minus 1 times x. E. <laughs> Oops, I don't think I was supposed to multiply those. Let's see. This we're going to do that because what is this break it out x plus 1 x minus 1 times x okay that's on the bottom x plus 1 x minus 1 times x let's pull out that uh, x plus 1 so we just have that 3 x plus 1 cancels 3 over x squared minus x. Okay, well they just left the... Okay, addition. Addition of fractions. Addition of fractions. The derivative... Der the derivation of... I if the identity above is straightforward, if we accept the formula of adding two fractions to the same denominator. Uh huh. For example, blah, blah, blah. Blah, 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 blah. Obtain the formula for adding two fractions with different denominators. We use a multiplication identity, the multiplication identity, to rewrite the fraction so that they have the same denominators. The multiplication identity? What the hell is that? Did we, we didn't do that. Did we do that? Oh my god. What is this? I have a multiplication identity. Oh my. Okay. Oh, let's see what they're saying. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I'm just going to do this so I can prove that to myself that I know how to do this. So they want to know how. Oh, wow. I don't know how to get this. Okay, so. How do I normally do this? Take the you take the denominators, and yeah, <laughs> you multiply. You multiply them right because you want to have the same common denominator. Then you just add them, so you get a over b times d over d plus c d and b over b. 
right? And then what's the output? Get AD over BD plus CB over DB or BD, doesn't matter, right? The associative property. Right, is that right? No, fuck, damn it. The commutative property. Okay. So we have. AD plus CB over BD. Right? Is that, is that what we have up? Yes. Yes, good. Cool. Yeah. <sighs> Decreation of fractions. Uh, fractions and. Oh, it's taking much longer than I thought. I'm not going to do the problems exercises. Keep going. Oh, geez. I think I gotta get behind already. <sighs> Should have more more coffee. the sum as a single fraction. What sum to sum? Remind me of the sum. What sum? Sum with the power. What part of this power? Um. <laughs> okay. What would I do I was just given this and saying right as a single fraction. Well, get a common denominator. Right? What's the easiest way to do that? Multiply by denominators. W times W plus 1, W times W plus 1, W squared, W squared, 2 W squared times W, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave them. Non, uh, I'm not going to multiply them yet. Plus 3w, w plus 1, w times w plus 1, w squared. <sighs> uh huh. Tell me more, tell me more. Two W squared plus three W squared plus 
W. Divide by blah 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 blah. I'm gonna add these together. I'm gonna multiply these together now. W3, W cubed, geez, W plus 1, um, 2W squared plus 3W squared plus 3W. W4, W cubed. I actually don't know what that is. W uh, cubed. Oh, yeah. Yeah, W cubed plus. No, is that a cube? Oh, whatever. Plus W3. Hmm. Thinking maybe I should have held out on that. Let's see that. Okay, so we got five W squared. <sighs> Plus three W. Let's pull out a W for good good times. Pull out a W from the top. Five W plus three divided by W cubed plus W squared. Is that what they have? No? Cool. I don't know what I did wrong, but I did something. Oh, no, I didn't. I just they didn't distribute because they were not adventurous. <laughs> okay. Cool, cool, cool. Division by a fraction. A divided by the fraction B divided by C is equal to A times CB. Okay, why? This identity gives the key to unraveling the fractions and of all fractions? Huh? Oh. So I think I know how to do this. Let's see. Y divided by X uh, divided by B divided by C. So I think I just flip them. Flip them. CB, CY, BX. Yeah. Cool. What is the explanation for that? That division by a fraction is the same as multiplication of a fraction. Hmm. But poor K. Why do I know that? Is it because of the multiplicative inverse? Multiplicative? Multiplicative. Yes, it is. Ah, because remember, a divided by b is a times one over b. So a divided by b, and if b is equal to some fraction like y over x 
it's equal to a times 1 over b or I don't know why I'm talking like that 1 over well that's not helpful okay I fell into my own trap <laughs> for x Ooh. yeah that wasn't really helpful What gives? What gives here? Dun, 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 dun. Oh, well, let's keep going. Let's say this is our A now. That's our B. So we have uh, one over Y times. No, yeah, no. <sighs> yeah, I don't know. Just that's the way it is. I'm gonna have to quit after this. Division by fractions, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, well. So, inequalities, intervals, and absolute values. Let's see if I remember all those. Numbers, well, positive. Yeah, cut that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, inequalities, transitivity. If A is less than B and B is less than C, then A is less than C. Got it? Multiplicate location of inequality. Huh? A is less than B. C is greater than zero, then A times C is less than B times C. Yep, got it. Got it, got it, got it. Ah, but here it comes to the sets, which that needs its own video. Okay, we're going to stop at page 26. So I'm going to move the calendar. I'm going to move. 0.03 to here plus 0.3 so we didn't finish I'm just gonna do that every time or hopefully not every time but whenever I need to add on and I don't finish or add it on right the main thing is just to sit down every day and keep going okay cool